I'm Trisha. This is Mike. We're from Dartmouth. Um, I have not, nothing to disclose. Um, I have absolutely nothing to disclose, but I really wish I did. So if anybody you know knows of any opportunities, I'll shamelessly promote any product for money, beer, or pizza. Spoken, spoken like a true medical student slash resident. Okay, so whoops, we are going to talk about the four T's, which is a novel way of thinking about how we're going to educate our residents and medical students by understanding cognitive load theory and cognitive science and using that to then make your lectures and your presentations better. To, to start with, just as a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm, we're going to use the term lecture. Um, as we practice this, we would say lecture, small group, focus group, sim session, educational session, and it was very cumbersome. And so we're going to use the term lecture, but we mean small group, focus group, sim session, educational session. It's just a little tongue tie to try to say that over and over again. So lecture means all those things. So the four T's are time, tell a story, technical elements, and tie it together. So in the beginning, I was an attending at Cook County Hospital and moved to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in tiny rural New Hampshire, way up in northern New England. A little bit of a culture shock, going from a gargantuan residency to a hospital that was thinking about developing a residency. It became a reality. We realized we got through the PIF, we got approved, we were going to start a residency, and I kept hearing people talk about death by PowerPoint. No more PowerPoint slides. Well, for my entire medical career, I had learned basically by 50-minute PowerPoint slide lectures, right? Bad PowerPoint slide lectures, reading PowerPoint slide lectures. So I decided before we got our first class, I needed to understand more, not just what kind of lectures to give, but why. So this is, many of you know, this is Rob Rogers. I went to one of the very first teaching courses to learn about that. I got active on Twitter. I started following Ross Fisher and his P-cubed. I went to lectures by Petra Lewis, who does a lot of undergraduate medical education talk about cognitive science and learning. Um, I went to slide lectures by Stacy and Tyson to try to understand it all. And I started reading more about the cognitive science. So if we're going to teach adult learners, you kind of have to understand how adults learn, or you're not going to do as good of a job, right? So then we finally have our first intern class. Now, when you're teaching six people, it's a very different situation than when you're teaching a full residency class, right? So every single lecture was just basically a small group discussion, because if a resident was in the CCU or on trauma, we had four residents there. And so it wasn't really full-on teaching yet, but we did still have lectures. And I had a whippersnapper flight paramedic come and want to practice a lecture that he was going to give for the critical care medical transport conference. And when he was done, I said, come, come to my office. Let's talk about how you can make it better. And I found a partner in crime in Mike Loria. Um, who was also very, very interested in the cognitive science and why learn, why we teach the way we do and how adults learn. So Mike had already gotten accepted to medical school um, and is now a third-year medical student. So it's a little unique to have a third-year medical student here, but you'll understand why in a minute. Um, we've managed to actually save him from the seduction of trauma surgery, um, and he has his emergency medicine sub-eyes set up for this summer. Um, so hopefully we'll be continuing to see more of Mike. Um, and he's going to talk to you now also about how he started to get involved in understanding cognitive science and presenting, and then how we ended up working together. So um, as Dr. Lanner said, I was a pararescueman in the Air Force. So I did combat search and rescue and um, medical support for different special operations teams in the Middle East, uh, in the Mediterranean, and North Africa. And toward the end of my career, I was sort of tapped to start teaching the new pararescuement, which was not exactly something I was thrilled about, but it was a really cool experience. And what I realized was that the military in general, and our career field in particular, had done an awesome job about understanding the cognitive science between 
uh, that was behind how people learn things, how people remember things, and how you applied it in very stressful situations. But what I realized was that when it came to the medical side of things, even in the special operations community, it was not applied at all. The medical curriculum was really flat, two-dimensional, and stale, and so we essentially, no pun intended, we had to resuscitate it. And what we did was, because we didn't know what else to do, we took some of those lessons from the cognitive science of teaching people how to jump out of an airplane, how to place demolitions, how to shoot, move, communicate, and we started applying them to medical stuff. And what we noticed was that there were some pretty cool results, anecdotally. Well, right around the time I started to get pretty good at that, I left the military. And uh, when I left the military, I went to work for the flight program at Dartmouth-Hitchcock as a flight paramedic, critical care paramedic there. And when I started to engage in the, the uh, wider uh, organization of paramedics and flight nurses around the country, I thought, for sure, in the civilian community, with these really smart nurses and paramedics, that they would understand uh, the, the science that was behind learning, especially this medical stuff. And what I realized is, was that wasn't necessarily the case either. They weren't quite as savvy as I thought they'd be. And right about the time I was thinking about engaging in that, I had basically discovered my inner academic masochist and figured it was a good idea to go to medical school. So I was taking that leap at that point. And I thought, for sure, at a medical school, the instructors have to have a good handle on this, right? They're teaching medicine. And so I remember, I distinctly remember this time in, in my uh, my first year fall where we were in our uh, physiology class. And I love physiology. I'm a physiology super geek. Paramedic school was like sort of the cliff notes. Medical school is like reading the book for the first time. And uh, I was so excited, super enthused. Go into the first day of respiratory physiology class and my enthusiasm is crushed. <laughs> because... We got 112 slides that looked like this. And as the instructor sort of faced away from us and read it through everything really fast and didn't really stop to answer questions or anything else, everybody okay? It just, it was so frustrating. We left there absolutely frustrated, dejected, confused. And I was like, I can't believe that medical education shouldn't be like this. And I really started to ask, why are we teaching this way? And more importantly, are there ways we can improve the way that we teach and we train in medicine? So what this led me to do is sort of think about that, that period of time in the military when I was training people and do um, take a much more academic approach to things and actually go through the literature. So I read everything I could get my hands on in the education literature, in the psychology literature, in the cognitive science literature. And as you can imagine, that was a lot of stuff. So me being the practical person that I am and being mildly ADHD, oh, a quarter, um, I couldn't really deal with all that stuff. I had to make it... I had to make it so I could wrap my brain around it and sort of uh, make it more practical that I could put into use on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I came up with was these four T's. This is my way of taking that stuff and chunking it into sort of four different groups, things I could use if I was building a class or I could share with other people who are making educational material. And so the way that I think about the four T's is it's essentially the low-hanging fruit. It's the evidence distilled into a handful of simple lessons that I think we can take and apply on a regular basis to improve education and really inspire the next generation of clinical providers, paramedics, nurses, medical students, or residents. And those four things are time, tell a story, the technical elements, and tie ideas together. And I wanna go into each one of those individually. But before we get there, I want to review a couple of very important concepts from the cognitive science that's actually going to inform the rest of our discussion here today. So in other words, if we teach evidence-based med medicine, why aren't we using evidence-based education to do it? So when you back up, the key is actually all the way back in the 1960s. George Miller kind of started cognitive, the, the study of cognitive psychology. He's the seven plus or minus two guy, right? Like you, the reason our phone number is only seven digits long. Um, it's not really seven numbers. It's seven units or seven chunks or seven however you want to divide it up, not just seven numbers. So it really started people thinking about short-term memory. And short-term memory, 
there are a lot of analogies. Kind of for this, it, it, you think of it as the cable or the cord that's coming, and it, it can only take so much information. Other people use RAM. Like if you think about it in a computer, like there's only so much RAM, and that's really your short-term memory, and that's what we're dealing with whenever we're teaching, whether it's students or residents or paramedics or or EMS providers. You, you've got you teaching to the short-term memory, and then they'll put stuff into their long-term memory. So if you're thinking about short-term memory, what that is is you, then you take take a step back into cognitive load theory. So your cognitive load is what you can take, how you can deal with your short-term memory. So there's three parts to cognitive load, extraneous, intrinsic, and germane. And looking out here, I can see at least one person I know who's an education fellow. Other people will be getting their master's in education. There's a lot of argument right now about whether germane is part of intrinsic, whether it's separate. How do you, it, It's kind of irrelevant for the purposes of what we're talking about now, as long as you understand the gist of it and how you're going to use that when you prepare your lectures. So to start with Jermaine, Jermaine is actually the learner, okay? It's, it's how the learner processes information, right? It's where your learner is. So if you, it's April, right? July's coming and it's, that's where we all come to the screeching halt and say, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, right, I remember I actually have to really go in and see every patient. I have to take that time. So think about your interns in July. You know, that those great big wide-eyed approach to things. Think about whether it's in, in a lecture, in a sim lab, or if you're doing bedside teaching, like in the last session, flash pulmonary edema, that 4 a.m. patient that comes in looking like they need to be intubated, but in an hour they'll be able to go to the floor. The first time an intern sees that, they have no basis, no scaffolding in their brain for how to process that. Their germane, their the ability for them to really process and understand that is high. It's a really high germane load. If you compare that to your June graduating senior, they have, if you think of germane load as having kind of a, a framework on which you can build, their framework in their brain and how they learn is actually quite substantial if you've done a good job they're getting ready to graduate, they can learn about flash pulmonary edema, some of the subtle details quite quickly because where they are as a learner is in a very different spot than where your July intern is. So your germane load is where your learner is and how they learn. So you have to know that when you're heading into presenting. Like who are you teaching and how do they learn? The intrinsic load is actually the material. All right, so the difficulty, the inherent difficulty of the material, how many pieces of information, you know, it, it, it is affected by the germane load of your learner, okay? So calculus is harder than arithmetic, but calculus for a high school junior is much harder than calculus for a math major. So the scaffolding from the germane load, the ability to process things in your short-term memory and to get it into long-term memory affects your intrinsic load or the inherent difficulty of the material. So you have to think about both when you're thinking about your intrinsic load. The germane load imp impacts it, which is why there's argument about whether they're separate or part of each other. So when you think about the intrinsic load of your lecture, whatever you're going to talk about, wherever, you're, however you're going to talk about it, you have to know the germane load, the level of your learners, the difficulty of the material, the time you need slash have, if everybody here just takes a second and thinks about a lecture that they gave, and if they tried to cram in extra stuff, it, the brain gets full, right? The learners just shut down and don't learn anymore. So you have to think about the time and then what your take-home points are. Right? We like to say when we're teaching our residents how to give lectures to begin with the end, like if you have a page and a half of take-home points, you might as well teach nothing because in a week they're not going to remember anything from your lecture. So you have to think about who you're teaching, what you're teaching, how much time you have, how much time you need, and what ultimately your take-home points are. Because it's much better to have fewer take-home points that they're going to remember than a lot of take-home points that they're not going to remember. So we have germane load, which is your learner, intrinsic load, which is the inherent difficulty of the material, and then we have extraneous load, which is kind of the junk pile, okay? Extraneous load is on us. It's the really cruddy slides. It's 
the YouTube video that won't play. It's the blinking light. It's, it's almost impossible to get extraneous load completely to zero. Like nobody ever gives the perfect lecture, sim session, whatever, but it's, you really want to get your extraneous load as low as possible so that it's not distracting, so that the learners can actually learn what they're there to learn. So the goal, when you think about short-term memory, when you think about that cable and the finite amount of information that a learner can process is to know your intrinsic and germane load and to limit your extraneous load. So that is the, ba the background then for taking us into the four T's. Because it's really, if you're really going to think about how to do a good presentation, when you look through the, the cord handout, there's, there are a lot, there are lectures on apps that you can use, there are lectures on using social media, on tweeting, on having better slides, but if you actually understand the science and how you think about presenting, it's going to be better. So, the four T's, and we're going to use the science throughout all of the descriptions of the four T's, are, as, as Mike said, time, tell a story, technical elements, and tie ideas together. Now, we're going to start, start with time. Um, so there's two different things with time. The three-second pause. So it's really hard to pause for three seconds. We do not like dead space. They teach us that in taking a history, right, to wait. And if you wait long enough, the patient will answer. It's true when you're asking your residents or your students questions. When they did a study trying to get people to pause for three seconds, like they knew they were being timed. The average amount of pause was 1.8 seconds. It's hard, but three seconds does get your learners to actually answer questions. The other part of the three seconds pause, though, is pausing to let your learner absorb what you're saying. You don't have to move right away to the next topic in a nanosecond. Even with a clock up here and the clock ticking, the three second pause is hard, right? Like to, to really let you, to pause and let the learner absorb, but it's useful. If you can, it's not just slow down in how you're talking, but rest for a second and let the learner absorb the information. The other part of time, it's actually how long your lectures are. Since we're in a 40-minute lecture, this is perfect. How many of you guys have seen TED Talk, a TED Talk? I would assume everybody in the room has. Okay, how long are TED Talks? 18 to 20 minutes. Why? Because that's how long we can focus. Somewhere between 18 and 22 minutes. That's how long you can focus before, as every person in here who's given a lecture, as I'm looking out right now, the glassy-eyed look. Right? So whether it's post, they've worked and seen patients in the morning, post overnights, or just there fresh for conference, somewhere around 20 or 25 minutes, the phones come out, the iPads go on, the, like, it start to doze like you're gonna go to sleep. I have one of my residents up here that I'm focusing on. <laughs> um, right? So that, that, it, it's somewhere around 20 minutes, you start to lose focus. You're just full. That's called cognitive backlog. Okay, there's science behind that too. You just can't process more than that. So when you're thinking about time with the three second pause, you should also think somewhere around 18 or 20 minutes about you should take a break. Now it's hard because the ACGME has told us that we have to do five hours of didactics a week. Four hours of conference time if you have a really robust asynchronous learning system you know, some of it can be in the sim lab, but you can't be in the sim lab the whole time. So we have these four-hour blocks of time. And, like, when I was in college, lectures were 50 minutes. When I was in medical school, lectures were 50 minutes. When I was in residency, lectures were 50 minutes. You do 50 minutes of lecture, 10 minutes of break. So now we're saying we should do 20 to 25 minutes. It doesn't mean you have to do a five-minute get-up-and-go-to-the-bathroom break. You do need some sort of a pause. Okay, I've seen it a couple times here. Like, it's been interesting watching the lectures at court over the years. I'm seeing more take a, take a short break at 20 or 25 minutes and process information. That pause, whether it's an anecdotal story or turn and talk to your neighbor, actually allows you to remember more. Like, you get the big brain dump of information and then a pause and then you can remember more. If you do small groups, 
if you divide up into small groups, you'll notice somewhere around 20 or 25 minutes, they, they start to have their own pause. You'll notice the conversations will go off. They, it's, it's, it is a, it's a natural phenomenon. That's actually the cue then to tell people to come back and to regroup, and that's a break. So try to figure out as you're doing this where your break can be at 20 to 25 minutes. So at that, on that note, we're about there. So I want you guys to actually turn to each other and to think about your own lectures that you've given or that you're preparing to give. To think about the whole cognitive load theory, the difficulty of the material, who your learners are. It's July. What's your orientation going to look like now that you have interns who have no scaffolding to move things in short-term memory, to come up with a schema to move it into long-term memory, or you have new PGY3s? What are you going to do differently now? And in a couple minutes, we'll come back and we'll do the next three T's. Yeah, I did, but when I'm talking about this. Okay, so that's three minutes right there. <laughs> <laughs>
just an observation. So this is usually the make it or break it point. You give them the break and people either usually bust out and make a run for the door. Or if they're sitting here, you know you're doing at least something reasonably close to what approximates a good talk. So thank you for staying. So number two, tell a story. If you think about it, stories are one of like the oldest, most natural, most effective ways that we've communicated ideas since essentially the dawn of time, just before we could speak, like caveman drawings, like, oh, 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 dear, you know, right? And still today, we do it in a very sort of casual way. You know, when I go to work, change into my flight suit, go downstairs, and sure enough, you walk into the team room, and people are sharing stories about maybe a really challenging patient that they had or the disastrous airway they went into on the day shift. And from what I can tell, it's similar in the ED. You walk in and you see an attending telling a resident a story or vice versa about a patient they had. It's a very common way that we share tacit knowledge. And it's very effective for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you tell a story, people begin to identify with the information that you're talking about. They can either recognize themselves being in that position, uh, examining that patient, or even concerns like, oh my gosh, I might have to actually treat a patient that like that someday in the future. And when you do that, when you begin to recognize that you could be in that position, you could be the protagonist of that story, something very interesting happens. This is called speaker-listener neurocoupling. So when you begin to identify with what a speaker is saying, and if you were to fMRI the speaker and the listener's brain, the same parts of their brain tend to light up. And the neurological consequence of that is actually very important. Two things in particular. First, when you recognize that it's like, man, that could happen to me, or oh, that's happened to me in the past, it directs your brain to pay very close attention to what that person is saying. And number two, it's also like a save signal to your brain. It says what this person is telling me might actually happen to me, so it's important, and I'm going to remember it. So it increases attention, and it increases retention of information when you tell a story. The other important aspect has to do with something called schema. So many of you may be familiar with this term, but it's essentially the uh, cognitive psychology jargon for how your brain sees something in its mind's eye, how you picture a concept in your mind. So if I say ventilator, for example, you might actually picture in your head the ventilator, the ventilator that's sitting in your ED what it looks like, where the buttons are, what the screen looks like. And then surrounding that image are more complex, higher-level ideas, different ventilatory strategies, different ventilator modes, so on and so forth. So a schema, I think about it as sort of like the framework for a house. Okay. The interesting part is that when you tell a story, stories are full of all sorts of rich sensory information what something looked like, what it sounded like, what it tasted like, felt it like, uh, felt like, what you even experienced as you were going through that narrative. And that does something really cool because it's essentially like finishing that house for you. All that rich detail is added to that schema and it's essentially like packaging it and handing it to someone. So remember that germane load that you're using to process thing and build that schema in your brain? When you tell a story with all that information, it decreases the amount of germane load that someone has to use to build that schema. And it's actually very helpful. Now you might say, well, we do that already. We do that all the time. We do case studies and give case reports and stuff like that. And that's true, but often the case presentations look more like this, right? It's a block of text and someone stands up here and reads off the case presentation and all those juicy little nuggets of information that your brain is looking to grab onto, what the patient looked like, what they were saying, what they were, how their posture was in the bed. They're either absent completely or they're tucked somewhere in this little text amongst some of these odd lab values and all this other stuff. Perhaps we should tell a story and we should give it that very rich sensory information. We should tell a story like this and tell someone what they look like. Give them visual aids to sort of aids to imagine what this patient is like in bed, what they're like sitting there when you first go through the door to see them. That might be a better way to do the case presentation. And that is why telling a story helps.
So you should use the technical elements to help you tell a story. So some of this is about the slide construct, but I don't claim to be an expert in that, and you get plenty of other opportunities to talk about slide construction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background behind why people give you the recommendations for the different slide ways to develop your slides. First and foremost is dual coding theory. So our brain processes what we hear and what we read by two different parts of our brain. They can be used together to augment learning, or if they're used in an incongruent way, it actually decreases your learning. So that's why you see people like Amal Matu, right, one of the greatest lecturers in emergency medicine, talk all with pictures. If he had a slide up there talking about early reciprocal changes and listing the things that you needed to look for on a slide, the imagery or the visual track would not be anywhere near as effective. Right? So he can be up there tell, talking about an EKG or talking about a patient with an EKG and show the image of an EKG. He can talk about the fine details in looking at an EKG and you're going to remember it a whole lot more because the EKG is an image and that goes through one part of your brain and the words he's speaking is the linguistic pathway and that goes through another part of your brain. So if you think about how you present, as using dual coding theory, you're going to actually make it easier for your learners to remember the information rather than harder. Now, people have actually studied, when you look at slides, where your eyes go. Okay, so this is a slide about sensitive skin. If you look at the slide, it's, it's a little hard to tell, like, I mean, it, you go to the baby's face. Whether or not a baby is relevant to anything that they're talking about is unclear. And then it goes to diapers. Not sure exactly what the diapers are going to have to do to it. There's not a lot on the paragraph. Okay, so there are a couple things about putting paragraphs up there. So when you, when you read, your, your intonation is different than when you're telling a story. You know, Mike was alluding to it earlier about the guy reading the, the respiratory physiology slides. But you put the case study up there also. When we read, we tend to either stand behind the podium and look like this or turn our back to the audience to read the slide, but you read in a very flat voice. When you tell a story, your intonation goes up and down. The other part is that when you read your slides, you actually are not reading at the same pace as the learner is reading. And so it, it, caught, it way decreases learning. They cannot listen at the same pace that you read and try to read at the same time. So they should never be reading your slides or your whiteboard or whatever because you cannot do it effectively. It doesn't even, it doesn't work and, and you've completely taken away all of the dual coding theory, right? There's no imagery if they're reading. You're going just with one track and it's not going to work. So this is an example of a bad slide. Now, there's a lot of words up there, <laughs> right? I can give you a worse slide that I skipped over. This is a really bad slide. We realized that you would spend a lot of time looking at a really, really bad slide and trying to figure it out. So slides that have font that yells at you, slides that have animations. There are, there are different apps that you know, you can really, you can spin things in and they can dissolve and they, that's all extraneous load. Okay, back to thinking about cognitive load theory. That takes away from learning. So you try, you can't really read these words. You can't, you know it's something about BiPAP. And there's too many words, so they're going to try to read them. Right? So it's much better to have your partner that you're lecturing with model the BiPAP and take the picture. Um, but it's, again, it, honestly, if you're going to talk about BiPAP, it's much better to have a picture of BiPAP or to have a picture of the BiPAP machine with the different settings. Then you can give the details. Now the caveat to that is you need to probably have good handout to go over the details so that they can go back and review it. But then if you have that, they're gonna have the image of what the patient looked like on BiPAP. They're gonna have the verbal memory of what you said as they look at what the notes were. 
so it, you get the dual coding theory memory um, from both channels, and your learning is augmented. Now, this part has been a little bit about slides, and like I, I know there have been a ton of lectures about slides. I actually like whiteboard teaching. I, I, this is hard for me. I'm, I use my hands a lot when I lecture, and I usually walk and talk, but I'll fall. Um, so I like being at the whiteboard. Um, it's a way, so you can, I know, I'm getting close. Um, so <laughs> I'll back up. I've got some fearful looks up here. Um, it, it, it is a part of dual coding theory, okay? So some people are artistically creative, and they can go up and draw a picture, which is what you're seeing. When you process one word at a time, actually part of how we read is that is recognized as an image and not necessarily reading. So a word can be one, either side. Um, you pause because you write on the whiteboard. You're asking your residents or your medical students about the differential, it's taking your three-second pause for them to answer. So you've got audience engaged with it. So it's a really, it's a, it's a great way. To, you're telling a story usually with a case, right? Because when we, when we do whiteboard teaching, it usually starts with a case. So it ties in a lot of these elements. But I put this slide up here just as an idea to show you that even with whiteboard teaching, you can make it bad, right? You can make it, you can take it away, right? Look at how many colors and arrows and lines. Like, that's a way to make whiteboard teaching bad. But in general, whiteboard teaching is a really good way to do it, in part because you have interaction with your audience. The timing is good. There's there's inherent pauses in, your, in how you do it. And you use dual coding theory in writing up on the board and talking. So when you think about it, whether you're, you know, whether you're using the whiteboard, whether you're doing a PowerPoint lecture like we're doing here, um, or the other place that I actually use PowerPoint slides is often if I break residents into small groups and then bring them together, you want to put your take-home points together so they walk out with kind of a concrete idea of what they're, they were supposed to be learning. So I'll have five or six slides at the end. You don't want a ton of words because you don't want them reading you don't want teeny tiny little words. I mean, you know, when you have to squint to try to see if you can read, like if people put a bad graph up and you're trying to figure out what the access is and you're squinting because you can't see it, the number of words, and then you want to limit the distractions, right? The things flying in and out, the logos, all of that kind of stuff. Now, there's a ton of resources on how to build a better slide. These are some of the books that I used. Um, We've included resources in the handout. There are a lot of lectures here on how to build a better slide. There's a lot of stuff on Twitter and in the whole, whole foamed med ed that you can find on how to build a better slide. But think about dual coding theory as you're doing it and use the science to your advantage. So the last T is tie ideas together. So tying ideas together is about consolidating information in long-term memory. It's about making it concrete and keeping it there over the long term. And we can do that in a couple of different ways. So one way is through something called spaced repetition. So spaced repetition is actually thinking about how we initially teach a topic and then how we review that topic in the time uh, in time moving forward. This was originally actually discovered and discussed by a psychologist named uh, Ebbinghaus. And basically what it is, is it's, let's say you teach about BiPAP on day one, and then two weeks later you talk about using it in a patient with CHF. And then three months later you talk about it maybe with a patient with asthma. And then six months after that you discuss it maybe referring to it in terms of using BiPAP for pre-oxygenation before intubating a patient. When you do that and space it out over time, a couple of interesting things happen. Number one, each consecutive time you review that information, people tend to remember a greater percentage of what you tell them, number one. And number two, it takes them longer to forget that information. So if you purposely space out the time at which you revisit a particular topic, they'll tend to remember more. 
The other thing is you can actually take a totally different, totally novel approach to how you teach something and give someone sort of that aha moment where they finally sort of get it. So I actually remember uh, an instance that I had. I had been a paramedic for about a year, um, still relatively new, naive, and had a very rudimentary understanding of CHF. Basically, at that point 10 years ago, if you had a heart problem and wet lung sounds, I was going to give you Lasix, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin, and we were going to the hospital as fast as I could. And I had a very kind uh, mentor of mine who is an ED physician, you know, call a timeout and very politely explain that CHF does not always equal fluid overload. And for me, at that point, my career was like, oh, that was kind of novel. And he took the time to actually pull out an eight and a half by 11 piece of white paper and go over with me next to the ambulance bay, the physiology of CHF. And so at that point in time, that was sort of like this, this light went off in my head. I was like, oh, I get it now. And I'm sure you guys have had that experience at one point in, uh, in your careers or one point in school, uh, at one point in school. And that, that event, presenting something differently so someone has that aha moment, is actually a really powerful event. Because what happens is, first of all, you kind of feel good, right? You're like, oh, man, now I get it. And that's because there's actually an increase of release of dopamine in the reward circuitry of your brain. So when we say it's kind of like brain candy, it, it really is kind of like brain candy. And the other thing is, in other parts of your brain that deal with transition of that information to your long-term memory, we also see increased neurological activity. So it not only makes you feel good, but it helps you remember more. So it's like hitting that neurochemical save button in your brain. So by spacing things out and maybe taking a different approach to the way we teach things, we can actually tie some of these ideas together and help people remember. So to summarize, our goal, you know, everybody in this room is at this meeting because they want to be an effective educator. This is what we hate, right? You look out and you see everybody falling asleep. So the goal is to avoid this, uh, this is a sensitive clicker, um, but to have this, learners who actually are interested, engaged, looking at you, trying to learn, trying to remember what you're teaching them. So you need to, to, to think about how do you manage the cognitive load, okay? So the intrinsic load of the material you're going to deliver, getting rid of the extraneous load that you can get rid of, Understanding the germane load of the material for your learner while you develop your lecture, thinking about the four T's. So time, the three-second pause, try and take a soft break somewhere around 20-ish minutes of some sort so you, your brain can actually, after a brain dump, remember some of it. Tell a story. We all learn better when we tell, when we, with stories attached. Manage the technical elements so that with dual coding theory, you, you you use it to your advantage, right? You want your learner to remember. And then at the end, over the course of the residency, you know, with the, the spaced application, it's not all just in the one session, but it's in the sim lab in two weeks and the, the standardized patient in four weeks and the lecture, how you're going to space it out over time to tie it all together. Your learners will appreciate it because they'll be more engaged. They don't want to sit through boring lectures any more than you want to give a boring lecture. You'll feel more energized because you're going to know that your learners are actually getting something out of it. And ultimately, the goal is that they'll be able to take the information to the cave or to the ED and apply it at the bedside. Great. We'll take any questions. Thank you.